The iMore Show is brought to you today by MailRoute, the leading cloud service provider for email protection. It's just a service. You sign up and they kill spam dead. It's easy to use, 99% uptime. It lets you focus on enjoying your email and not managing your email. To remove spam from your life for good, go to MailRoute.net slash iMore for a free trial and 10% off for the lifetime of your account. Hey everyone, it is May 27. Actually, I think it's May 29. It is May 29, 2014. I'm Renee Ritchie, and right now we're going to talk about Apple buying Beats, WBDC 2014, and all the week's news. This is the iMore Show. Joining me as always, we have the managing editor of iMore.com and the biggest kaiju fan on the internet, Peter Cohen. How are you, Peter? Oh, that's me. Hi. How's it going? Good, good. How are you? Very well, thank you. We also have, joining us, one of my favorite bloggers in the universe, the editor-in-chief of Mac Rumors, uh, and also the power behind the scenes of Touch Arcade, App Shopper, and a bunch of your other favorite websites, Arnold Kim. How are you, Arn? Hey, I'm good. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being here again. I mean, let's get it out of the way. <laughs> uh, there we go. You make me a sad, sad panda. <laughs> So this this is it. This is what Apple spent three billion dollars on. Did you just go buy those? Just I did. <laughs> just just for the bad. photo. So Arn, I'll start with you. Is is this worth three billion dollars? Is that a fair question? I mean, I think a lot of people are critical of it. I mean, obviously it's worth a lot. Like they they have a ton of sales. So from a revenue perspective, you know, accounting perspective, I'm sure it's worth around that. Um, I forget the numbers, but people threw around that they had like over a billion in sales, in, um, at least in revenue, like last year or the year before. Um, whether or not people think Apple needs Beats, I guess, is really the question that comes up, and that's why people argue so strongly about it. And I don't know. I, I feel like it's still early. I think what's interesting is how it'll affect Apple's culture and like executive team if. Um, I don't know how involved Dre will be, but I guess Ivan, Ivan, I don't know how to pronounce his name. Ivan, he, uh, obviously he seems like a big player that everyone respects, so um, how much influence he has on Apple and direction outside of maybe just the streaming side, uh, we'll see. That, that's, yeah. So the story is, so far, as far as I understand it, um, Apple bought Beats. The, uh, the Beats hardware division will be under the purview of Phil Schiller and his uh, worldwide marketing organization, which will be charged with getting more Beats headphones and speakers into more stores around more parts of the world. And the Beats music division will be under Eddie Q's purview, and he'll be in charge of taking those 200K, 250K subscribers, trying to attach those to Apple's 800 million uh, credit card accounts and getting that... Um, streaming audio service into more parts of the world. Peter, is that fair? Is that accurate? Yeah, that's fair and that's accurate. And I think that Iovine and uh, Beats Music are a big, big part of, uh, of of what this acquisition means. I mean, if you, if you take a look at the, the, uh, the press release that went out about this, if you read the internal note that Tim Cook sent to employees, uh, it's really clear that... Um, uh, it's the music end of this that really excites them. And having Jimmy Iovine, you know, you've got the founder of Interscope Records, you've got somebody who's enormously, enormously well-respected within the music industry, uh, working um, as an Apple executive, ostensibly to bring that into um, uh, uh, sort of the, the, the next era of whatever it's going to be. And let's face it, Apple has had... Um, I, I think to a certain degree it's fair to say that Apple's had a bit of an image problem when it comes to music. You know, Eddie Q's done a great job of running Apple's uh, software and services, but um, it, iTunes itself is 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 leaderless. It's rudderless. You know, they're, they're, it's, it's a great place to download music very easily and relatively um, uh, uh, trouble-free. Uh, but uh, there, there isn't a really big personality to, to, to match the strength of the service within the music industry itself, and Jimmy Iovine brings that to the table. So it's a very interesting uh, match from that perspective, and I think that that's got a lot more to do with it than those 
goddamn things I wish you'd take off your head. Well, let me ask you about those, and I'll start with Arn. So the knock against Beat headphones is that they don't sound great. They're just really bass heavy. Um, some people have argued that McDonald's doesn't taste great. It's just incredibly popular, you know, and oat cuisine is, is not what the average person wants. Christina Warren, friend of the show, had a great post, I thought, where she said that Beats is to music what iPod plus iTunes was to music 10 years ago, and that is a trendy thing that all the kids want. Is, it, like, is there a big brand cachet value here? I mean, clearly there's a brand value to Beats that, you know, and, and I don't know if I agree with how, you know, Apple's trying to say cool so much as I feel like it's, it does fit their general, you know, they've always been about uh, good design, good style, good, you know, coolness factor, I suppose, amongst uh, pop, you know, pop culture, um, but they've also been behind quality and, you know, that, I mean, been for quality and, like, and trying to, you know, I think, Despite, you know, Apple's products not being maybe, you know, the high, catering to the high-end market, I think they are pretty good quality for all things, you know, all across the board. Uh, what's weird to me about the whole Beats acquisition is how this will look in the future. I mean, in two years, three years, is, I, I, I presume they're going to keep the Beats headphone line separate as like a subsidiary. But that is unusual for Apple to have a completely separate line that's not Apple branded. Are we going like to have FileMaker, Apple Beats? Right? Yeah, and FileMaker is totally neglected and no one cares about. I, I, I guess that's the best example, but that's sort of a historic uh, relic. Uh, can Beats survive under the shadow of Apple or expand beyond without Apple like really pushing it as like their own brand? I want Peter's take on this, but uh, Raustam Karamov in the chat room, um, one password brain trust, was asking if, if the Beats brain brand is going to stay separate. And Apple has indicated so far that it is, that you know, what Arn said, it's going to be managed as almost like its own entity. Peter, is that tenable? Well, here's the interesting part of that. Ammunition is the company that's been designing uh, Beats Electronics products, like the headphones and the, and, and, uh, um, the pill and so on. Um, they are parting company with Beats. Um, uh, their, their founder, um, uh, who ironically is uh, f a former Apple employee who is, you know, a, a design guy for Apple, Robert Bruner, um, said, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's tough to step down as chief designer for a brand that I take uh, so much pride in, but it certainly makes it easier knowing that we are handing the reins over to one of the, most, the world's most successful design teams. He's talking about Apple. So Apple itself is going to get very involved in the development of hardware. Um, for for the Beats brand, and this actually is probably the first glimmer of good news I've had through this because as as people who who read I more know, I have been very critical of um, this acquisition Everything. from the start. Yeah, and part of it is just because I've had really mediocre experience with Beats products. I'm not impressed by the overall build quality of the products. I'm not impressed with how good they sound either. Um, if Apple can improve the engineering that Beats is doing um, with with its headphones and its speakers, nothing would make me happier. It would be fantastic. But, you know, Apple has a very spotty track record when it comes to designing stuff um, that, 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 that sounds good and really kind of lasts for a long time. I mean, you know, there are a lot of fans, for example, of the iPod uh, uh, Hi-Fi that Apple introduced, oh, God, many years ago now. It must have come out, what, close to 10 years ago now? Mm -hmm. And it's got its acolytes, but you know it was a product that Apple discontinued and let fall by the wayside pretty quickly as soon as MFI devices came into their own. Um, so it'll be interesting to see two things here. First of all, what Apple actually does with the Beats hardware brands, um, and you know how Apple design changes um, that. They they obviously don't want to kill the goose that laid the golden egg. They really need. Um, to make sure that beats still, you know, have a cachet, a youth cachet, are trendy, um, are continue to be popular, but they can add some refinements there um, that make it an Apple brand and uh, might make it a much more compelling uh, product from an engineering and and design standpoint than it is right now. That's kind of exciting. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, Arn, they sell a whole bunch of different headsets in Apple stores, and I guess leaving Beats as a separate thing will allow them to continue doing that, not have to just, you know, they don't sell Windows PCs, only Macs. They don't have to sell only Beats headsets. Correct, yeah. Uh, we have a question from Enzo... Um, 
Sorry, the name popped up. From Paul Gann, sorry. Will technology infrastructure of Beats somehow improve the Apple TV and TV and moving streaming services? I'd like to just go on record that three seconds after this announcement, Gene Munster did, in fact, release a comment saying that he hopes that this harkens to the Apple television set. I, I, I don't know if this is a technology purchase, Arn, but it, 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 it seems more like a talent purchase, and if Jimmy Iving can negotiate deals for them, maybe that's the only way it could help. Yeah, I mean, it seems like it's a... I mean, it's obviously a major business acquisition regardless. I mean, did Apple need to buy any specific technology from Beats? Probably not. But obviously the brand and the product line, as well as a billion or so dollars in sales, are what they're buying with the $3 billion. But certainly it seems like Iovine is the, is the major pickup in terms of, uh, I guess, vision negotiation. But his, his stuff has always been on the music side. And whether or not the headphone side can grow enough for to be relevant to Apple, I guess, remains up for debate. I, I just don't see how, you know, even if, if Apple does improve the headphones and people, you know, they get good reviews, oh, these are, you know, solid headphones, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's still sort of weird, again, as a Beats-branded product, I, I don't know if it, it raises Apple's, um, if it'll raise Apple's relevance in, the, in that area if, if it remains Beats. And then the other side is... Uh, the streaming music service, I guess, is a growing business, but it's still a fraction of, of ultimately, like, the iPhone business. And I, I can't see, you know, I guess it, it, it drives further sales of hardware, further sales of headphones, I guess, is now the halo effect, presumably. I guess. I mean, uh, Tim Cook gave many, many interviews. Like, this was car clearly well-organized because he was in almost every major media outlet. And he said it was a no-brainer. He said that Apple could absolutely have built out all these things, but Apple didn't have the... They, they just did, they didn't need to. They didn't need to build the 27 different elements on their own and take the time and expend the man hours or you know, person hours and the effort to do all that when they could just buy beats and that was a jump start for them. But most importantly, it was you know the talent, Jimmy Ivey and Dr. Dre sure. and the people at Beats. Is there have been some thought that Beats also helps Apple increase their addressable market because Apple is a brand that came you know primarily from when Steve Jobs returned to the 90s through the 2000s with the iPhone, but it's not growing. It's not entering all parts of American culture, not all parts of global culture. And Beats appeals to an, an entirely new audience that you know could be significant Android users or could just not have not be in mobile or not be into smartphones or computers yet. But how does buying a Beats product? bring you into the Apple ecosystem, or will it? It seems like it wouldn't directly. Yeah, because the brand is different. Well, the brand how, is different how does... There's no interoperability issues or questions, unless Apple changes to proprietary headsets. Well, there are a couple of things to bear in mind here. First of all, you know, the, 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 the headsets themselves work with everything, right? So they don't just work with iPhones or Macs or whatever. They're, you know, they're, they're a device that will work with anything with a headphone jack. Secondly, Beats Music is available on um, two platforms that Apple's got absolutely no penetration in right now, uh, you know, Windows Phone and, uh, and Android. By choice, though. Right, by choice, but still, it gives Apple an, an ability to sort of work its tentacles out into um, other ecosystems that it really hasn't had a presence in from that, that from that standpoint. So it's it's an interesting strategic move from Apple anyway, if they do choose um, to go down that road. One of the things that I thought was interesting about um, Tim Cook's letter to uh, internal letter to um, uh, to, to Apple employees announcing this was that he talked about um, how much they liked um, uh, the the editorial and curation team on Beats. And this really seems to be a strong point of Beats music uh, compared to using iTunes or iTunes Radio, um, you know, in some ways using Spotify as well. I, I've been using it for a while, and I, I really get a kick out of uh, some of the features of it, and it, it does a really good job matching what I want to listen to in ways that um, I don't get from using Spotify, Spotify, Pandora, uh, iTunes Radio, and other streaming services like that. So, um, you know, th could they have built out uh, this ecosystem? Yeah, as a matter of fact, I said that same thing in that, uh, that editorial that I was ranting about this whole thing when it started. You know, I figured, what's the point of Apple buying Beats considering they can do all this themselves? But, um, you know, the flip side of it is that uh, now they have that ecosystem and um, they can 
make it even better. Long term, though, I'm curious to see how this stuff starts to integrate further down the road. Like, are there going to be features in Beats Music that are going to make their way into iTunes or vice versa? Are we going to see Apple try to lower the bar um, to get people uh, using um, uh, Beats Music uh, in ways that don't cost $100, for example? Um, you know, I'm already paying Apple 25 bucks a year for iTunes Match. I don't know how much more I want to spend um, uh, or how much more money I want to give Apple uh, for streaming music services. It's going to be an interesting point to see how they integrate this stuff going forward. Yeah, that's a problem with all these acquisitions for, I mean, even for Google or for Facebook. You know, Facebook bought Instagram, but they're not integrated. They're just sort of separate products. And similarly, I don't know where if, again, that's why I feel like, I mean, Beats business is great, obviously a profitable business that can probably sustain itself, but whether or not Apple brings it into the fold more or not will be the question. And I don't think Apple's ever been good at that, at doing the integration well with outside, you know, they're all more about their own ecosystems. And even their, within their own ecosystems, there's the core stuff, and then there's sort of iCloud, which is, you know, never really the star of the show. So <laughs> The Siri team is slowly being integrated. I don't know how integrated it is yet. It wasn't that integrated up until recently. I don't think the um, Authentic team is that integrated yet. Um, some yeah, of the other teams were dispersed amongst the different app teams, so that was easier. Yeah, at least those are clearly features within the product. So Authentic and uh, Siri were clear, distinct features. So they could, I mean, you know, whether or not they were more independently, um, but you know, if we're talking like integrating services between Beats and iTunes, that sounds messy. And then uh, whether or not the headphones set. I mean, you know, so ultimately, I think I agree with you. Know, there's a lot. There was a ton of speculation before the actual acquisition was announced about why Apple's doing this, and it seems like iVine's the key, and that's what was speculated. And it, and maybe that's the thing. Is he the visionary? Is he the the lead? Like, can he lead like beyond just the music side? And I don't know. Maybe, maybe that. I mean, we'll find out in a few years. So one of the questions last night, Peter, is HP has Beats on the uh, on their on their laptops, and they said they're going to continue doing that for the length of the current year's agreement. Uh, does Apple now get Beats on the Mac? Do you want Beats on the Mac? Oh God. Um. Do I want to see Beats on the Mac? God, until you said that, I hadn't even thought about it. And uh, my first reaction is, no, not really. But maybe, you know, may maybe th maybe there's a place for it on the Mac. You know, the Mac, Mac sound systems, they, the speakers integrated into iMacs and MacBook Pros especially are very good. Um, you know, Apple's been on top of its game for audio output for a very long time. And I'm not just talking about built-in speakers either. I'm talking about... Uh, you know, digital optical uh, output, you know, through the headphone jack and all that stuff. Um, it'll be interesting going forward to see if this stuff does get integrated into um, into not just oh, oh, not just Mac products, but iOS products in any kind of meaningful way. It would seem to be a no-brainer that Apple should do something. Um, but uh, I, what the future holds for HP, I, I, I am unclear on. Here's a question from the chat room from Bong Bong. Um, might the Beats acquisition enable Apple to move into the Samsung Android market as far as lower-end smartphones go? Imagine a direct competitor price-wise and design-wise. So I guess this question is saying if Apple keeps them as a separate brand, can they make an El Cheapo phone to sell in you know, feature phone markets that, without having to dilute the Apple brand? I hope not. It's definitely not Apple style. I mean, that's the whole thing. That's the whole weirdness about uh, a subsidiary of Beats. I mean, and with your question about Beats integrating into MacBooks or iPhones, uh, it's just it's weird. It just seems like it would dilute the brand, Apple brand by adding throw another throw. You know, a MacBook Pro with Beats just sounds. It's I don't know like... if that helps. Anyone. No, I I don't think it would be a situation where Apple would throw the Beats logo on. Uh, a MacBook Pro or an iPhone or whatever, but if they integrated some of Beats technology um, into Apple products to make them sound better, that could be a thing. Well, using these headphones, Peter, I, I can say that you sound like a basso profundo. You have like a real um, James Earl Jones timbre going on. Oh, very nice. Yeah, likewise. I've got my uh, 
my cheap Beats ripoffs from from Sony. Well, that's funny because like Sony smartphone, they leverage a lot of brands. Like they have their Bravia displays and their PlayStation games, and they they basically throw every Sony subsidiary logo they can at the spec sheet of those devices. But I don't think it's helped them uh, in terms of brand awareness or or sell through. It really hasn't, but that I think has got has a lot of cultural problems at Sony, you know, with just the the disparate ways their different business units operate. So, you know, it's it, it the the comparison may not be valid from that perspective, but um, you know, th this is this is uncharted waters. To to Arn's point a few moments ago about, uh, you know, it would be uncharacteristic of Apple. A three billion dollar acquisition is uncharacteristic of Apple. So I think we've established that we're in, uh, in in uncharted waters. It's the new Apple. Although three billion dollars is still not a lot of money for Apple. I mean, I, I think Chris Wieslowski this morning said it's it's one dividend payment. Yeah, it's ten percent of their uh, their their domestic cash on hand, and an even much smaller percentage of their foreign cash. So, um, it materially it doesn't make a huge impact on Apple's bottom line. And one of the things we've talked about previously is that there is no next iPhone business, or at least no one can see it yet. The iPhone makes the kind of money that only oil companies make, and you know a watch won't make that kind of money. You'd have to sell so many watches at such a high margin to get anywhere close to that. It's not, it's not economically possible. But making a lot of small things is economically possible. So if two years from now, three years from now, Apple has a range of headphones that are $100, $200, $300, $400 at huge margins. If they have a subscription music service that's mitigating against the slowing or the the leveling off, as Eddie Q put it, of music downloads, uh, and if they're using, uh, you know, Jimmy Iovine and Dr. Dre in interesting ways to shore up their deals with Hollywood, I don't know if they'd ever get into actual content production, um, which might be more along Dre's uh, specialty, but they could have a bunch of other businesses that are, once again, adding new revenue in just as older revenues taper off. Is that is that imaginable, Arn? Yeah, and obviously Apple is... Coming off the iPhone, it's hard for them to find another iPhone. There's the, the beauty of the iPhone mobile phone business is that they're heavily subsidized, so the profit margins are huge compared you know, to what the consumer's paying. And then there's also a natural upgrade cycle of every two years. I mean, not everyone upgrades every two years, but there's that option. And a lot of people do upgrade, because why not? You, know, you get a substantial uh, break on your new iPhone. Uh, so yeah, there's, it's hard to imagine. Apple can fill that gap in any way. I mean, I think the argument against the television always always been, you know, how many how often do people upgrade their televisions, which is like, I don't know, eight, ten years? I don't even know when the last time I've... Whenever John Syracuse tells me. Yeah. And then the same with the watches, I guess. You know, so from a hardware perspective, the Beats business makes sense. It's sort of, you know, I mean, criticisms of Beats quality aside, I think, you know, they are a well-established brand with high-margin products, and they sort of reinvented or invented that high-end um, non-tech uh, you know, audiophile market. So I think, you know, I don't completely think, you know, I think Beats has just a bad rap because of, I don't know, I guess the question of quality versus value, at least from the audiophile perspective. Um, and uh, there's probably some history. I, I guess there's some history in the, how the business was built. There's some, you know, uh, I guess, I don't know. Do you, do you, are you familiar with, like, the story of, like, how... <laughs> I don't know how ruthless the business was when it was started, but I guess there's the beats, Yeah, that. there was a bunch of stuff with uh, Monster Cable, and I think then, then yeah. they had the whole HTC drama. Monster is, like, <laughs> like, the innocent, you know, pure person, pure company, but anyway. Uh, and Peter, any any closing thoughts on this? I mean, Jimmy Iovine said that he's been asking Tim Cook or asking Apple to buy them every year for ten years, and he finally got his wish. You know, I I, I can't say that I was really that I that I am really that enthusiastic about the acquisition acquisition, but I remain open minded about it, and I'm looking forward to seeing what happens in the future with us. It'll be really interesting, I think, for all of us. Uh, you know, especially those of us who have invested a lot of time and uh, and and effort in tracking what Apple's doing to see um, how this all plays out. What I can tell you right off the top is is that Wall Street hasn't been overwhelmingly impressed by this. Uh, not that that is particularly meaningful. It must uh, be great then. Yeah, but uh, you know the the analysts that. Uh, um, uh, that that determine uh, not determine, but but help affect Apple's stock price. 
uh, really haven't been overwhelmed by this deal. So, you know, it's it's an interesting segue into WWDC next week. So you're saying that Dre's going to perform at the Beer Bash? Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so we're going to take a short break. I'm going to tell you about one of our amazing sponsors. And, Peter, this time it is Backblaze. Backblaze is online backups, $5 a month, unlimited, unthrottled, uncomplicated. You can go to www.backblaze.com slash imore. And I know you just wrote an article about the importance of online backup, right? I did indeed, yes. So what's the advantage of Backblaze? Like, it, How does this help me? How does this make my life better? Backblaze enables you to just basically set and forget a backup. So as long as you've got a live internet connection, your stuff will be backed up um, uh, to uh, Backblaze's cloud service. And if you need to restore your files, uh, you can do it. The advantage here, uh, layering Backblaze on top of another backup strategy like Time Machine, is that if something happens to not just your Mac, but also your house or your Time Machine backup, you know, if your house burns down, uh, you know, heaven forbid, or uh, um, uh, your 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 time capsule craps out, you can still restore your files if you need to. Uh, Backblaze is very easy to set up. Five dollars a month per machine, um, it, and it's uh, incredibly easy to use. Yeah, you, there, it's founded by ex-Apple engineers. It runs natively on the Mac. It's easy to restore one file, all your files. It's an iOS app, so you can access stuff from anywhere. Email alert notifications. And what's more, they're offering a 15-day trial with no credit card required. Just send an email address and a password. You're up and running. No add-ons, no gimmicks, no additional charges. Five bucks a month per computer, unlimited, unthrottled backup. Once again, www.backblaze.com slash iMore. They're supporting us, so please support them. All right, next on the rumor, actually, I can't even call Beats a rumor anymore. Now that Beats is done, the next rumor is iOS in the home. And this was Tim Bradshaw writing uh, for the Financial Times that he's heard that Apple is working on a way to better integrate with um, home automation stuff. Now, it's not home play, like there's AirPlay and CarPlay, because those are services that basically push um, or, or send iOS interfaces to television sets, to car displays. This is a made-for-iPhone-like program, made-for-iPod-like program, made-for-iPad-like program, where um, Apple will just certify that your equipment works great on um, on iOS devices. And Arn, I don't know about you, but I use Hue Lights. I use Sonos music players. Um, one of our writers, Georgia, has a Nexia home security system. All of that is run off the iPhone already. So this, I guess, is... If this is real, it just sounds like it's a way for Apple to better ensure the quality of those things. Yeah, and presumably for Apple to have some control over that ecosystem. I mean, they already have made for iPhone, and honestly, I, I'm not sure where they're going to go with this. Uh, I think some people were hoping for like, a bigger Apple integration where it's like an Apple, uh, Apple branded ecosystem, but uh, my impression, and I think from what the headlines I just saw, that it sounds like it's just going to be another sort of made for iPhone, which gets me less excited, and ultimately, I think Apple's never been, I don't know if about the made-for-iPhone program, how, like, in terms of, like, the relative success. I think it's a big moneymaker for Apple. Um, I don't know for the consumer it really changes anything. Uh, I mean, these, like you said, these things already exist. Unless Apple adds some value or adds some, like, integration that's not currently possible, then otherwise we're just talking about sort of a, a, a logo and brand, right? And a licensing fee and a licensing fee, and control. Uh, I know there was some criticism about Apple's um, controllers, uh, game controllers, that yeah. they're too expensive and not high quality enough or whatever, and then you know, there were some rumors that it was that was partially due to Apple's insistence about like what price point to set and those sort of things, and that level of control, I don't know, personally I think hurts Apple. I think a lot of people think that, and you know, they've had some success in controlling the App Store as much as they can, but I think Apple's, the App Store success was despite Apple's control in a lot of ways. Yeah, Peter, you've written about the Made for iPhone uh, controller program that it never really lived up to its potential. I know a couple weeks ago Mark Gurman was on talking about Apple and Nest. I always thought Apple would never want to make the Nest thermostat, or at least not anytime soon. They just want to make iOS work great with all of those things, but is is... Uh, this seems like such a conflicted history of whether it'll go well or not. Yeah, you know, there are a couple of conflicting things here. One of them is that, um, you know, Apple is occasionally really ambivalent about working with uh, third parties to enable their products to work well with Apple products. And another thing is that 
Yeah, we've got this, as you said, this body track record, specifically with the MFI program in the wake of iOS 7. I had high hopes for game controllers in iOS 7. It looked like a no-brainer. Apple would, you know, or Apple developed this API for iOS 7 that um, enabled anybody to come out with um, a game controller that, you know, could work um, with iOS devices. But the problems... Um, have sort of outweighed um, the, the benefits of it. A, a, a fairly limited number of devices um, uh, compared to the overall install base for iOS uh, 7 uh, work with these, with, with these products. Secondly, um, they work inconsistently. And uh, what's worse is that they're really expensive to use. Um, some of that seems to be related to the licensing program itself that Apple is employing for these things. Uh, I haven't gotten a lot of hard details about what people are paying, but it's pretty clear that there's some attempt to, um, you know, keep it at a level playing field, and it makes it much more than just an impulse buy for people. I mean, you can buy um, a, a good OEM um, game controller, gamepad for your PlayStation or your Xbox for a fraction of, uh, of what these things cost. So it, it, it seems to be a sledgehammer uh, to swat a fly sort of problem. Yeah, it's interesting to me, too, because Google had uh, Android in the home announced uh, two, maybe more years ago, and it never really went anywhere. And yeah, Google tends to announce a ton of stuff, and they can never give enough attention to all of it. Um, but Apple has announced a lot of things that they haven't had the time to follow up with either. I had a lot of high hopes. I had a lot of high hopes because, like, you know, the and I said this before, the code name for iOS in the car, which became CarPlay, was Stark, which is a reference to, you know, Tony Stark and the Jarvis um, computer system that ran his house. So I, I, I love the idea of my entire house having a beautiful Apple-designed interface, but this doesn't sound like that yet. This sounds like it, it leaves... T I know, Arn, you just said, like, you know, Apple exerts too much control, but we've seen with things like Passbook, such spotty... Um, like, some apps are barely UI web views with crappy web buttons and PayPal hooked onto them. The areas that Apple doesn't control are sometimes terrible, too, and this is sometimes the worst of both worlds, where they have enough control where people can't do what they want, but not enough to ensure they do what we want at the same time. No, I agree with that. I mean, obviously, Apple shines when it has... It does shine with the integration with, you know, the fact that the iPhone and the Mac are, like, totally top-down hardware software for them. I mean, that clearly, that's their strong point, and that's where they've... Uh, they've won. That's why people, I think, were hoping that this home integration would be an Apple Nest-like product or a series of Apple Nest-like products. And that, that's where you can kind of get some excitement and also functionality that doesn't exist um, beyond, um, beyond what we currently have. But, I mean, ultimately, it depends on if launching this program... I mean, the question is, does launching this program, and obviously we don't know the details of it yet, does it value add, or is it just sort of a certification? Because if it's just a certification, then I'm not sure we're going to see a lot of innovation in that area where it versus unless there's some way that they actually add some value or consistency or, I don't know, an Apple media or home media server or something that somehow adds some abilities to it. Yeah, my thing would be, because I have a lot of these apps, is that they are still, like I, like, I just had to turn on my lights for the podcast. I had to take out the app. The app takes a long time to launch, and I have to go to the right screen, press a button. It's not always that convenient. And, you know, CarPlay is an interesting example, because, again, this won't be HomePlay. It'll be something different. But with CarPlay, you can use the built-in QNX system to connect with any phone. But if you have an iPhone, you get access to CarPlay. And it'd be interesting if Apple could work out something where if you have the made-for-iPhone home automation, you had better access to certain APIs, or maybe you had extra APIs. Maybe you could do some sort of faster launching or, or, or some way that gave you a superior experience on iOS, because then it would be value-add for the customer, sorry, for the, for the vendor to do it, and value-add for the customer, because I'd get a better experience for the apps that bothered to be made for iPhone. Right, and maybe there'll be a consistent API and or interface, like a passbook for home automation. Homebook. Yeah. <laughs> Homework. I don't know. Uh, switching gears slightly, Peter, the uh, the big deal for a lot of uh, a lot of the stuff we've been hearing about this year. You know, last year iOS 7 was the big deal. This year, there's a lot of attention being paid to OS 10 10.10. Uh, there's still a lot of tens in that for me. It's apparently getting the redesign. You know, Apple didn't have time to do the redesign last year because so much effort was going to iOS 7. They have the time now, but we're also hearing a wide range of rumors. Everything from there'll be a few changes to some people are are incredibly excited. Like you know, like. I don't know, UI kit for, for Mac excited about this kind of stuff. 
how is your how are your expectations being set? I'm just gonna call it Duran Duran from now on. That's obscure. Yeah, I guess so. Um, so I, I you know, I, I think that um, uh, OS ten is long overdue for a um, a UI rework to help pull it a little bit more in the direction of iOS seven. I um, or a little bit more uniformity with iOS overall, I guess I should say. Um, I, I've beaten that into the ground. I'm not going to go over it again. Um, you know, everything that, that, that I've heard suggests that 10.10 um, uh, .10 is going to be a significant update uh, in, in ways that are much more significant than Mavericks was. Um, that's great. You know, looking forward to it. I cannot wait to see what Apple's going to do. The big head scratcher right now are what kind of hardware announcements we're going to get out of it. That seems to be a moving target. We know what uh, Jim Dalrymple has noped yes. anyway, so I guess we can. What did he nope? Just for the just for the people listening. Uh, he he's discounted the possibility that there's going to be a cheap iMac next week. Yeah. So uh, some people, I think, in the last OS 10 beta, right, 10.9. Saw reference to a next generation iMac, but we don't know how far out that is. And Jim said nope for WWDC. Well, he said nope to specifically to what Ching Mi Kuo oh, the cheap, yeah. uh, was was uh, was talking about, which was a cheap iMac. So, you know, if Apple refreshes the iMac and it's the same price, Jim's nope is still good. Yeah, Arne and I go back and forth on this on Twitter and, and stuff sometimes because some people believe that Chimmy Quo is really good. I believe that he has that the stuff that is that he's when he sticks to pattern, those patterns hold true for him and everyone else in the known universe. And when he deviates from pattern, he has like a 50-50 <laughs> track record at best. Is that yeah, fair, Arne, or not fair? I mean, you know, it depends on how generously you interpret some of the things. I mean, obviously, uh, January predictions for October. You know, it, it, I think there are subjects change, but I think I mean I've been a fan of him uh, as an analyst. I mean, presumably, I mean also the the, the you know the comparisons. You know, the other analyst competition is not very good, so there's there's that baseline that you have to that you're contending with. But besides that, I mean, he certainly predicted very specific um, things in the past that have come true that weren't necessarily by the pattern, and things that didn't come from anywhere else. You know, I think he predicted the discontinuation of the 17-inch MacBook Pro a few months before it was gone. And I think that was a surprise discontinuation. I think the hardcore 17-inchers were very... Um, they're still angry, Arn. They're still angry. And at the time, everyone was like, well, this, you know, this is you know, BS. No one's going to... You know, this is not a you know, good thing analysts aren't calling the shots at Apple, those sort of things. So, I mean, you know, there are very specific non-guessable items that he's predicted, which is why uh, I've paid attention to him a lot more. And... Uh, but, you know, you're right. I mean, obviously, it's not 100%. Uh, if you look back, depending on how generous you are with some of the predictions, uh, you could, you know, let's say we go down to 50%. But 50% is pretty good. Uh, for, it's you know, better pretty, than other analysts, I'll give you that. Yeah, I mean, it's a ton better than other analysts. It's better than most. And um, I think there's enough there that you have to pay attention. So, yeah, we'll see. I mean, I think Dalrymple clearly snoped. I think you can note both the iMac, and there was also talk of an 8-gigabyte iPhone 5S. Yeah, uh, as like a quiet update, but I don't uh, even know if that would boot. Quite frankly, <laughs> Dalrymple note both, which you know, and Dalrymple has been 100% on his Yup note uh, prediction, so we'll go with him. Uh, but you know, if if an iMac comes out quietly revised in the you know two weeks following WWDC, I think, I think uh, you know that's still probably credit for uh, so you know Co. So I want to hear what both you and Peter think about this, but let's just roll out some options. So last time you were on the show, it was before WWDC last year, and I started, I'd heard things about, I actually called the episode Mac Mini Pro, because I'd heard the next Mac Pro was going to be a mini. No, not, not exactly a mini, but really small. I have not heard anything about a next generation Mac Mini, despite it being officially the oldest, I think, computer on the Mac Rumors buyer's guide. Now, I don't know if that means that just no one's really talking about it. I don't know if it's still... MIA, how long can Apple go on that, Arn? Uh, unfortunately, Apple, <laughs> I guess the question is how many Mac Minis does Apple really sell and care about? Uh, I don't know. Mac Mini's been sort of a spotty history. I think uh, Apple Insider called it like a dead product like three or four years ago, and then it kind of came back to life. Uh, what do you think about the ARM rumors? I mean, there's that's the other sort of like... Uh, Wild card around all you know where 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 some of like the Mac Mini might go or like or the future Mac. So my understanding is, and uh, just and it's a good thing to get off the plate right away is like like a Apple prototypes everything. Apple's had ARM um, MacBook Airs for two or three years at least. 
And I think, you know, one runs iOS, and you know, they, they've also ported OS X, I believe, to ARM. But it's not really a product. It's something that, you know, when Intel wants to increase prices or delay roadmaps, Apple dangles over their head like a sort of Damocles, and then magically Broadwell comes out late this year instead of early next year. And I think that's the pattern that's going to continue, because there's so many questions with, like, if it's an iOS MacBook Air, do you emulate Mac apps? What do you do about Boot Camp? I mean, it becomes a, like, the, we start doing the, ramif like the, the ramifications of that are not trivial. Um, it's the same reason why they haven't put out, like, the, they have touchscreen Macs, touchscreen iMacs, touchscreen MacBook Pros. They just don't think it's a product. They don't like the entire concept of doing that. So I think all that stuff goes on internally. That's the duck legs going really, really fast, and then they surface very specific products. And it's the same, um, I think, Peter, it's the same with the Retina MacBook Air, is that that sounds like it's really tied to Broadwell, and Intel has punted Broadwell until, they were trying to punt it until the end of last year. I think now it's scheduled for the beginning, sorry, the end of next year. Now it's scheduled, I think, for the beginning of this year. Sorry, the end of this year. I'm having quantum flux. And I, I don't know if you can do a Retina MacBook Air on a, on a Haswell platform. Yeah, one of the advantages advantages of Broadwell over Haswell is that Broadwell's got much faster integrated graphics, and every um, extra bit of graphics speed helps when you're dealing with a Retina display because you're pushing so many more pixels. Um, so uh, Broadwell seems to be a no-brainer for that thing. Uh, having said that, um, I, I don't think that Apple wants to... Um, uh, kill uh, potential sales of their existing product line by demoing something um, so early uh, in the development cycle, um, you know, because people would just say, oh, okay, well, you know, never mind then, I'm not going to, uh, uh, to, to buy a laptop until this new one well, comes Well, they did out. it with the Mac Pro, right, but that's, that, that the Osborne effect on a Mac Pro is significantly less than it would be on a MacBook Air. Yeah, yeah, I, so I just, I don't, I don't see it happening. Do you have any sense of where what people want or what you'd like to see in terms of new Macs at WWDC? Arn? I mean, it doesn't sound like there's going to be much new Macage at WWDC, at least from all the rumors. It sounds like it's going to be a software, you know, iOS, OS 8, iOS 8, Mac OS 10, 10 type show. I think everyone's, you know, I think that's the problem with the Mac side of the rumors is they, they tend to be a little more boring, I think. You know, the, the generational jumps tend to be smaller, the um, release cycles are relatively predictable. I think the biggest Well, they're tied thing, to Intel, right? So you can look at Intel's roadmap. Yeah, cool, except for the Mac Mini, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm hoping, I feel like Apple um, will do another Mac Mini small bump at some point. I don't know what they're waiting for. Um, I guess the most exciting thing on the horizon is this rumored 12-inch MacBook Air Retina hybrid thing. So, like, the rumors are like a thin 12-inch MacBook Air, basically. Uh, so it's sort of a cross between the Air and the Pro, I think, with the Retina screen, but it's also supposed to be a lot thinner than the Pro itself. So those rumors are probably the most exciting for people. People love their 12-inch MacBooks or PowerBooks, <laughs> as it was. Um, uh, but that's not scheduled, that's not believed to be coming until fall. So I think from a Mac, like, perspective, hardware perspective, the WWC won't be that exciting, but I expect 10.10 .10 will, um, hopefully, as Peter was saying, it sounds like there's talk that it's going to be a pretty major upgrade, both for developers and probably consumers from a visual uh, aesthetic look. So that's where all the excitement's hopefully going to be. And then iOS 8. Jeff Kervin in the chat room is saying, how much would it blow everyone's mind if 10.10 .10 natively supports running on both Intel and the ARM? I would, have, um, I would expect OS X has supported both of those for several years, the same way OS X supported running on Intel natively for several years. Like the whole Marklar project before the Intel Mac shipped, that's just, again, that's just how that it, Apple is a smart company, and that is a smart way to run a company. Could we see, Peter, potentially could we get bumps, spec bumps at least, maybe even in a press release and not at the keynote for MacBook Pros? Are they... They didn't get updated like the MacBook Airs just were. Wouldn't surprise me, you know, because as you point out, the MacBook Airs got got uh, got bumped. It was a very mild bump, but it was also a price reconfiguration. Um, the the odd duck out right now is the MD101, the standard 13-inch MacBook Pro. This machine was last updated um, in 2012. It's an Ivy Bridge-based system. It's Apple's very last computer with a CD DVD drive. I I I would love to see Apple kill it. But I suspect Apple wants to replace it with something before they can do that because it's still a pretty popular seller. It's a popular seller because people look at it and they see the 500 gig hard drive. 
um, compared to 128 on the similarly priced MacBook, 13-inch MacBook Air, and 13-inch MacBook Pro with Retina display. Um, they see the internal CD DVD drive as something that they still want, just as a convenience item or maybe as a security item, because they still have a lot of media on DVD or you know audio on CD that they haven't ripped yet. Uh, but it is sticking out like a sore thumb. It's just, it's it's a, and the interesting thing about that is that it's based on the same core technology that the Mac Mini uses. So the, these two devices are sort of the anachronisms in the Apple product line. Uh, whether um, Apple bumps the Mac Mini uh, to be more aligned with a 13-inch MacBook Pro with Retina display, you know, bringing it up to a Haswell chip, 802.11ac, and some of the other... PCI uh, storage. PCI <laughs> storage, yeah, indeed. You know, that would actually be a pretty big deal. It would be a pretty big deal because the Mac Mini has ramifications way beyond just consumer use. You know, the Mac Mini is a great entry-level system for people who don't want to spend a lot of money on their first Mac or maybe have a PC tower that they're migrating away from and they're, they don't want to have to buy a new keyboard, mouse, uh, display uh, to get it to work. The Mac Mini makes it a very palatable alternative. But the other killer application for the Mac Mini is this is a workgroup server. It's great for small to medium-sized workgroups. It's great for small businesses. It's great for education. And Apple sells quite a few of them in those configurations. Um, so Apple needs the Mac Mini. It's going to hang on to the Mac Mini for a while. I haven't heard anything about a new Mac Mini at Dub Dub, so I don't know if it's going to happen next week or uh, at some point afterwards. But uh, I think there will be some Mac news next week. So one thing that Peter and I are arguing about, Arn, and I'm interested in your opinion here, is I, I often Apple puts new panels in the Macs first. Like the iMac will get the new panel, and then later on when it's in supply balance, it'll go to the the Thunderbolt display, but they have this Mac Pro out there that can drive 4K displays. I've heard they've been working on a 4K display for a while. We haven't seen it yet. Uh, Peter would rather not have a 4K display. He just wants a Thunderbolt 2 display without 4K. Break that tie for me, please. Whether Apple What do you want? What do I want? I want a 4K display. Yeah. No, who doesn't, right? I mean, that's the... Peter doesn't. Boo! Boo! All right. I mean, once you've had a Retina display, everything else. I have, I have, I have a 30-inch Apple Cinema display still, nice. uh, so it's showing some age, but it definitely seems pixelated compared to my Retina MacBook Pro. So yeah, right. I want, I want 4K. All right, but hear me out here. The problem with 4K is that there are Other only problems. two Macs. There, there are only two Macs that support 4K right now. There's the 15-inch MacBook Pro with Retina display, the late 2013 bump, and there's the uh, the Mac Pro. You can't get a, 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 a 4K display to work on any other Macintosh. Won't work on the Mac, uh, on the iMac, won't work on the Mac Mini, won't work with any other MacBook Pro or or, or MacBook Air. So you you are taking um, you are the Thunderbolt display is already a niche product, and you are making it even more of a niche product because the other devices in Apple's product line that could use it haven't been refreshed to support it yet. Yeah, well, Renee asked me what I wanted. Whether or not I actually think it'll happen is is up for debate. I mean, I think there's this, you know, when Apple neglected the Mac Pro for so long, everyone was saying Apple doesn't care about the high end, and they really don't. Like, I'm, I think people were surprised that the Mac Pro got updated ultimately. And I think Apple's looking for the, you know, $30 billion business, not the, you know, whatever, I don't even know the size of the high end Mac market, uh, which is unfortunate because I, you know, I think a lot of us sort of, have always we've grown up craving like that high end Mac the Pro market. The inspirational, you know, supercar product. Yeah, no, exactly. And then the Mac Pro is amazing, of course. Uh, you know, the 30 inch Apple Cinema display cost like twenty five hundred dollars when it was released, and it was a lot. And I, I you know, eventually I got one. <laughs> I, but the uh, I would, you know, I, I, I 4K sound interesting. I think the other issue with the 4Ks and the Retinas have been that the natural resolution is still. I mean, it's it's a higher density resolution, but it's not as much real estate, right? Well, I mean, if they if they do if they pixel double the current displays like they have for other like for iOS Retina displays, you'd get more pixels. But 4K, given what they're doing with scaling modes, at least I think on the Mac, right, Peter, it's not really that sensitive. Right. It was still like uh, Marcus. Um, you, you know Marcus. Uh, Marcus yeah. runs Mobile Nations. He, he's got three of those 4K monitors running off his Mac Pro now, and he could basically run NORAD off his desktop if he had to. <laughs> It's just, it's just insane. I, I, I don't have a Mac that could run it, Peter. I want it. I don't even have a Mac that could run it. How crazy is that? I, I'm in the same boat, man. 
All right, we're going to take one last quick break, and I'm going to talk to you about our other sponsor this week, and that is lynda.com, L-Y-N-D-A.com. Uh, what lynda.com does, and you can go to the URL, lynda.com slash imore, uh, for our special link, is they train you how to use stuff. I cannot tell you how often I've gotten a new piece of software, whether it's Final Cut Pro uh, 10, Logic Pro 10, and I just have no idea how to use it. And I, you know, I can ask people, and they might frustratingly help me a little bit, but I can also just go to lynda.com, I can sign up, it's one flat rate, I get access to all their videos and I can learn everything that I want. And not just me, they have uh, videos for everyone with a variety of interests. There's over 2,400 courses taught by experts, one low monthly price, $25. Peter, I don't know about you, but the idea of a family member of mine going to lynda.com instead of me is just like a breath of fresh air. Indeed, and having used Linda, I can vouch for their services. It's a, a great, great resource uh, for people who actually want to learn uh, how to do things. I am trying to move from editing the podcast, the audio podcast on GarageBand to audio, editing them on Logic Pro 10, and I've gone running back several times because I'm not very audio savvy, but I'm trying out the Logic Pro 10 course right now, and it, it might actually work for me. It might be enough to penetrate even my brain. Excellent. So, I mean, they've got a lot of stuff on there. They have um, iOS essential training. They have keynote essential training, iPad for business. It improves your skills. Premium members with an annual plan can download courses to their iPhones and iPads, take them with you, watch them offline. Uh, and the nicest thing is that they've worked out a special deal with, uh, with us. So they can give us a special offer to access an entire library free for seven days. That means you can go in there, you can kick the tires, you can learn a little something, you can see if it is for you. All you do is go to lynda.com, uh, lynda that's L-Y-N-D-A.com slash iMore. You start your seven-day trial, and uh, I hope you love it as much as we do, and I want to thank lynda.com for sponsoring this week's episode. All right, so the last thing we haven't talked about and the thing that we're getting a lot of questions on is iOS devices and iOS 8. Apple hasn't released any new iOS hardware at an WWDC for many years, not since the iPhone 4, I believe, was the last one. Um, they, if people who are expecting an iWatch, Apple has never introduced a new consumer-facing product at WWDC for as long as I can remember. The original iPhone was introduced at Macworld, the original iPad at a special event. Uh, if, and, if and when there is an iWatch, I expect that will also get a special event. But iOS 8 will be there. Now, uh, you know, Peter and I have talked about this a lot, Arne, so I'm interested in your take. Given how big a change iOS 7 is, what are you expecting for iOS 8? Well, I mean, if you go by the rumors, I guess the big thing is the health book stuff and then some tweaks or revisions to existing, uh, existing services, maps, and whatnot. So it sounds like it's going to be a, a, like a... Not a, I don't want to say minor upgrade, but not as ma major uh, revision as iOS 7. At least that's my impression. I think it's going to be tweaks. The health book still thing, thing still confuses me a little in terms of wide appeal. Did you have you guys talked about that in terms of where Apple's going with its health book? Yeah, so you're you're a doctor, so I really value your opinion on this. But I made a joke when they first announced it that I'm not sure an iPhone randomly spitting out hamburgers wouldn't be more popular than something with HealthBook. I just don't exactly. like. I think HealthBook is incredibly aspirational, but I I don't know how many people would. Like, maybe even if one person uses it, it's good. I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's a reflect. Obviously, uh, Tim Cook's a big, from all we know, is a big health fitness nerd, right? And yeah. it seems like he wears a Fitbit. So he sounds sounds like an area that he's genuinely interested in. Uh, and, you know, the Fitbits and likes have grown, that market's grown over the last few years, but it's still a tiny market compared to, you know, what we're talking about um, with everything else Apple does. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, I, so I was, I'm a physician. I don't practice anymore, but uh, my interest in health book personally is relatively low <laughs> as, like, a personal product. Uh, I don't have a, a walking tracker. I guess I... I yeah, you know, there, there's that aspect of it, and then the question is, what else? Yeah, I think the iWatch probably is is the unanswered question in that in that mix. I think if if you make the because without the sensors, uh, I, yeah, it's it's more of a software accessory to a product that you don't that most people don't own. That's interesting. Like, so does Apple announce HealthBook at WWDC, or do they wait and announce it with iOS 8.1, for example, at the iWatch event? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think iWatch is definitely happening, right? There's no... I, I, is anyone doubting that that's actually a serious project in Apple right now? As far as I know, as far as I've heard, it's in production. I think, you know, German, a lot of people have heard the same thing. 
Yeah, and the rumors have been persistent, but they've also been like consistent and from you know relatively you know New York Times, these are like you know areas that like you wouldn't think would just be idle speculation. Uh, so yeah, again, I, I think Health Book sounds like it's the cornerstone of the new of iOS eight, but again, for long term appeal and like broad appeal, it's still up in the air for me about how many people actually care enough. And then tweaking, you know, Maps is always good. Siri is good, and you know, they've made, Apple's made a lot of small acquisitions over the last few years, including mapping and transit and those sort of things. And so, focusing and revising and improving on the consistency of iOS itself seems important. And uh, my understanding, I think maybe you said this, is that everyone's focusing on 10.10. .10, so maybe iOS 8 will be a smaller incremental uh, revision, which I think would be welcome. One of the things that's hard for me is that, um, and I've explained this before, but if you haven't heard it before, you know, people listening, uh, iOS development is a bit of a continuum. Like they're working on features, and if they don't make it in, like background uh, refresh was scheduled for iOS six, didn't make it in, ended up in iOS seven. Uh, there's a, there's a bunch of cases about of that. Um, so it's hard to predict. Like there's there's an idea of what Apple's working on, but which makes it to eight point, you know, eight point oh, what makes it eight point one, what makes it to iOS nine is sometimes hard to figure out, depending on priorities, resources. What I'm also interested in, Peter, is that there's been some rumors, you know, there's a lot of people who want iOS to be more like the Mac or to take over more of the Mac functionality. And for them, you know, Apple ported over XPC, their, their um, communications protocol, a couple of years ago. They, they split Springboard into Springboard and Backboard so that background processes could be handled independently. And there's a bunch of people who would like to have better inter-app communications so that, for example, they can just move photos around or move files around without having to save them to camera roll and come back again so that they could have things like 1Password uh, or Text Expander fill a text field in iOS the way it does in OS X. Do you think that is would make iOS better, or do you think it would make it just too complicated? Do I think that better inter-app communication would make iOS better? Yeah, does, it, does iOS need to become a more powerful computing platform, or is it better staying simple and leaving the rest of the Mac? I think it does, but I think that the, the way that it needs to happen needs to be very careful to maintain the existing user experience. You know, the worst thing that Apple could do would be to um, open up inter-app communication and increase complexity of, uh, of, of use a great deal. So there's a very careful balance that Apple needs to maintain, but uh, it, 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 there's no question that iOS um, is going to have to evolve as uh, people continue to depend on uh, not just iPhones but iPads as well um, to get their work done. It's interesting to me too. Uh, like there's the security factor. iOS is a security-first operating system. You know, Steve Gibson from Security Now called it a beautiful crypto brick, and Apple does everything they can to maintain that security. And that that security is is in opposition to inter-app communications because everything is sandboxed. So they'd have to work out a system to punch through it and do a bunch of other clever things. But I think Mark, uh, sorry, I think Arn, there is a um, there is a market for people who want to do just a little bit more, and Apple has been good at like hiding multitasking, hiding notifications that are hiding control center from people until they sort of trip over it. Right. No, I, I think it's time. I think it's you know I think inter-app communication, a better API for that, allowing apps to communicate with each other is definitely. It's been long wanted by obviously the techie crowd, but I think even the layman really like understands it now. I think there was some education early on, you know. So we're we're seven years into iPhone now, right? So you know, the first smartphones, I think, uh, when Apple first introduced the, the metaphor, the icon uh, grid, and the, you know, the concept of apps on a f smartphone, I think the simplicity was good because it prevented people from uh, running into problems. Not having a file system, obviously, was, I mean, the file system on, you know, any desktop Mac, you go to anyone's house, there's, like, files all over everywhere. That they, you know, they're not organized. So hiding that complexity was great, but I think, you know, we're seven years into the smartphone thing, and I think people understand, you know, the people understand smartphones, and Apple can certainly do a good job, like you said, with multitasking and thing, uh, providing extra functionality for people who care, and then limiting, you know, pre basically preventing confusion for anyone who is still just starting out. And I think inter-app communications, I mean, I would think that that would be easily um, abstractable for the user. I mean, it, it doesn't, it's not going to affect you until you actually want to use it. And then we already have the share button or the save the camera roll. It would just be, you know, presumably just an extension of that. Uh, but now you could send your app, your photos to some other app directly or uh, provide other integration. So I think it's time. I think people are ready for it. I mean, if you talk to, I, I know non-techie people who have Android phones who have all these sort of widgets and whatnot, and they enjoy them and understand them despite, you know, not being 
uh, you know, full-time blogger people. <laughs> <laughs> Not having an engineering degree. Right. Is there anything else that you'd like to see? I mean, I, one of the things that's been consistent over the last few years is Apple sort of smoothing out the iPhone experience, taking off rough edges, and, is, and, and filling in gaps that they just didn't have time to do before. Is there anything else glaring at you? Like, I know I have my long-seated desire for a file repository, but what, is there anything that's been bugging you about iOS that you'd like to see fixed? Uh, I mean, honestly, the in-app communication is probably a big thing. I th I think uh, you know your file repository may happen ultimately if, if that such a system exists. I mean, you could imagine a uh, a file app that just accepts all API <laughs> like requests and stores them, and then you could send them out everywhere else. I don't know. I don't know if that's possible with with what Apple's planning on doing. But uh, no, for me, the inner app. I think additional functionality, replacing stock apps more, being able to use different photos. Photos, you know, camera apps, a little more customization. I think is ultimately what I would like. Um, yeah, default apps is an is an easy interface for me to imagine in settings, but it would be a big. I don't know if political is the right word, but it would be a big change in attitude from Apple. I think to allow Apple's own apps to be replaced as defaults on iOS. Yeah, and Apple's control over the app ecosystem is obviously a big related side, which, you know, there's definitely been some bad stories. We've been, you know, App Shopper was affected by it, App Gratis and everything. So, uh, you right, know, let's, get that. Let's, let's get into that. Let's get because I want to do the App Store as its own topic, so I think it okay. deserves it. Peter, what, do you, what, do you, what about you? Anything, anything that you would like to see um, improved on in iOS or made different or changed? Well, uh, like you, uh, Renee, I, I really want to see uh, AirDrop uh, interoperability between iOS and OS X. Um, beyond that, no. You know, I don't know if it's because I'm not, like, a huge power user of iOS. I probably um, could get a lot more out of it if I really invested the time into it, but my head still stays on the Mac most days. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing, is that there's so many different users, and a traditional computer user uses the iPhone and the iPad as a peripheral to that computer. It's just a, it's like a, a way of taking a subset of your data mobily with you, but increasingly we have people who aren't, who are not only, you know, um, Phone, f phone first, but phone only. And I think that's where you're getting a lot of the pushback from is people who do want bigger screens, who do want higher functionality because they don't want a computer with them anymore. Some don't even want a tablet with them anymore. I think there, I think there's a specific use case too for people who for for people who have substituted having a computer with having an iPad or another tablet device. You know, I see people at, in, in when I when I work retail at the Apple retail, uh, reseller that I work at on the weekends. I, I see an interesting thing, and that is that people come in with their phones, and their phones are just phones for them. You know, the, in some cases. Every once in a while, I'll see a power user who's really getting the most out of their phones. But, you know, the phone's the device I use to message people. It's the device I use to occasionally make calls, get get directions on, play some games, maybe use a couple of special purpose apps. But more and more people are getting a lot of work done with the iPad. Um, you know, they're they're buying an iPad with the idea that they they are replacing an older computer that they don't want to have to use anymore. Um, they're they're jumping to an iPad from maybe a Windows PC, uh, you know, maybe a laptop. Um, but they're thinking of these things as this this thing can do almost everything that I need a computer to do. And admittedly, their use case is very different than mine is. The idea of replacing my computer with an iPad to do everything I do fills me with, you know, just an existential loathing that I can barely... The Godzilla uh, rampage through Tokyo. It really would be. I mean, it would be an awful thing for me to have to deal with. Uh, but I, I'm not everybody else. A lot of people, you know, are like, you know, all my I do is... primary pay computer is an, is an iPad. Right, because what does she do? She checks email. She plays, you know, she plays words with friends. Maybe uh, hits the web, does some shopping. Maybe balances her checkbook. I messages me a lot. I, I messages you a lot. Yeah, these are not things that you need a full a full fledged computer for. Uh, so how Apple balances that in the future with iOS is going to be really interesting. Because what's good for the goose may not be good for the gander. In that. Uh, the way that people work with their iPad may not be the same as the way that that, that people work with their iPhone. So, um, uh, are you just wasting time building functionality into uh, uh, iOS that only one or the other can use? I want a hybrid iPhone Mac, the size of an iMac. I can carry it on my shoulder. I can do all my compute now. 
I don't necessarily want that. Aaron, you mentioned the App Store, and that's a really good thing because WWC is ostensibly for, well, aside from the keynote, WWC is 100% for developers and designers uh, who make all the apps that all of us use. And it, it is an absolutely arguable point of view that Apple hasn't done everything they can to, to help increase the value of the App Store for those developers to ensure that we get super high quality apps that we love. It, they've almost commoditized it as a way to get tons of cheap content for your iPhone. And that's created a real tension. And there are, yeah, the control issues like you guys went through and other people went through. Um, there's slow changes, like uh, Apple a few months ago made it impossible for people to, to re-download or upgrade. Um, apps that they got refunds for and they added a pop-up a couple weeks ago. Um, but though that seems to be on a glacial track record. Do you think there's any... What would you like to see as someone who's been through this happen with the App Store in the next while? I mean, yeah, the App Store has its issues. Obviously, it's been a great success overall. Uh, there's so many, like, potential... You know, I think from a developer, like, app developer perspective, I think the rules have always been a big sticking point, the whole, you know, you can get sort of put into limbo in terms of uh, uh, app approvals, so, and, and there's a certain lack, I mean, I know they, they've released, and they, they've done some improvements, they've made the list of, you know, here are what the apps that you can have and the apps you can't have, um, but, you know, it's still, you, you, you don't know for sure until you put in the development time to put, to submit an app to the App Store, so, I think Apple's control remains a sticking point for a lot of developers. You know, certainly, I think a business like App Gratis is was whether or not you agreed with their business model, they they were essentially shut down completely from the App Store. They got you know pulled from the App Store. Um, so, you know, I, I think from a developer standpoint, App Store rules and transparency have always been like an issue. I think the other issues are discoverability. There's been um, Especially with Apple cracking down on any app recommending apps, like you know the app grasses, app shoppers of the world, um, they kind of are putting that responsibility on themselves with their, you know, I guess their version of curation in the app store, and it just seems like there's a better, there should be a better way, uh, and I don't claim to have an answer for that. I think, um, I think. But they are taking more responsibility. If you start shutting down like apps like AppGratis or other apps that people use to discover other apps, and Apple needs to have their own solution that's better, equal to or better. And so far, they've been really slow in developing that. They acquired Chomp years ago or a couple years ago, and I guess we saw some mild changes in the user interface related to Chomp with the screenshot screenshots first. But beyond that, I think people are still very critical of like the discovery. So that's why people end up on the free charts or the top charts as like the primary way to discover new content, and then. And those got cut down too, right? Those are only 150 now on the iPhone. Yeah, so I, you know, I don't know. That that seems like a relatively small change on the app itself, but I, you know, I, I you do get the impression that Apple doesn't like the Wild West nature of the App Store, you know, with. Uh, well, let me ask this: as a game, because I, I know you also as a gamer. You know, you and I have had lots of good conversations about. You've recommended a lot of good games to me over the years. You know, especially at stuff like MacWorld and WWDC. Does it, as a gamer, it kind of hurts me to see the candy, like, the, the, it kind of hurts me that the App Store seems optimized for stuff like the Candy Crushes and like the Clash of the Clans, when there's so many gems, even app gems that are, you know, fantastic $5, $10 apps from great indies, a lot of care, a lot of concern, and it's getting harder and harder for them to make a living on the App Store. Because that's the software I want. Yeah, it's hard to blame Apple for that trend completely. I mean, I guess, you know, the whole free-to-play, I think, was, I don't think Apple, Apple is responsible for the popularity of free-to-play. Obviously, that's where the money is, both in gaming on uh, not just mobile platforms, but even on desktop platforms as well. So I think the Apple just responded to the game industry there, where everyone demanded, you know, ability to monetize through free-to-play. And understandably, if you look at the top grossing list, it's pretty much entirely filled with free-to-play apps, such as Clash of Clans and Candy Crush. So, uh, you know, it's hard to blame Apple for, for that, direction, um, because I think they were just responding to the market forces, and I think even as, like, you know, consumers, it's it's hard to find, um, it's hard to take a chance on a $5 app when that, your only exposure to it is the screenshot. Mm -hmm. um, but that's where it comes back to, you know, Apple needs to do a better job somehow in uh, providing that curation. If, if, if they're, especially if they're going to take, especially if they're not going to allow any other curation apps on the App Store. Well, that's the thing, Peter. I was complaining about this on Iterate. You get a trailer for a movie. You can download a sample chapter for a book. You can listen to 90 seconds of music. You have no way of previewing an app still, and it's 
you know, what is it, six, almost, almost six years post App Store? Well, and I think that was one of the big motivations, uh, you know, in 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 making uh, in-app purchases and and sort of forcing the free-to-play model. You know, free-to-play enables you to download and just keep spending over and over and over again for the same thing. A few developers have experimented with different ways of trying to manage that, like. Um, uh, uh, um, uh, the the company Strange Flavor, uh, their uh, uh, recent release um, had the ability to basically unlock all content after you spend uh, the equivalent of I think like ten or fifteen dollars. Um, you know, maybe that's one way to go. I, I don't know. I don't. I don't know that. Um, that, that downloading demos would fix all of the problems with the way that uh, payment systems have evolved in mobile in the, in the mobile market. We have all these problems but no answers. That's mm. why we get to do this and not that. No good ones anyway. <laughs> all right, so I'm going to start wrapping us up. Uh, aren't any anything else you'd like to see from Apple at WWDC? I mean, I, I'd like to see Linda Ahrens for a few minutes on stage. Anything <laughs> on your wish list? Uh, it seems like uh, Angela Ahrens, I apologize. Yeah. It seems like that's likely to happen. Uh, I got nothing specific beyond what we talked about. I mean, I think, uh, you know, normally these key, you know, I guess you always want the big surprise, right? That's sort of what, you know, what Jobs is famous for, the one more thing at the end. Uh, sure, I'd love them to unveil a 4K display at the end of the keynote, but, I, I might, you know, my expectations are pretty realistic. I think it's going to be OS 10, iOS 8, maybe Dr. Dre. <laughs> <laughs> um, and those sort of things. Uh, I don't expect any, um, you know, new product surprises or anything beyond some new iCloud stuff, maybe new features. Uh, yeah, you know, Apple's not been. I feel like iCloud's fixed backup, fix photos. Yeah, I mean, I guess only is related to iOS eight, presumably. Peter, anything else on your wish list? Uh, just the usual unicorns, uh, free ice cream, and self-driving cars, world peace. Yep. All right, awesome. So we are all going to be there. Um, Peter and I are going to be covering the show. Aaron, I think you're going to have a bunch of people there as well for Mac Rumors and Touch Arcade and App Shopper. Yeah, not App Shopper, but yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> They'll be moving quietly behind the scenes doing all the hard work. Um, so if people want to find more about you, if they want to follow your coverage, Aaron, where can they go? Uh, on my Twitter, I'm on Arnold Kim, and then MacRumors.com, of course. Peter? On iMore uh, at iMore.com and also on the Twitter at Flarg, F-L-A-R-G-H. And you can find me at Rene Ritchie. You can find me on all the Mobile Nation sites. Peter and I are going to try to find a quiet place to record a show soon after the keynote, probably in the evening after we've had some time to digest everything. So the iMore show might come out a little bit early next week. Uh, if you haven't already, the best way to enjoy the show is live when we do it in studio. You can just come to iMore.com on Thursday at uh, 1 p.m. Now, actually, we might be moving the show, so I'm not going to say that. Keep it tuned. We might change the day of the show, so just keep that in mind. But if you miss it live, you can always go to iTunes. You can go to RSS. You can find both the video and the audio feed there. I want to thank everybody for watching. I want to thank the chat room for taking part in the show. You guys make a great, fun experience. Aaron, Peter, I look forward to seeing you in person at WWDC. Yep. See you next week, man. Bye, See everybody. You